My name's Scott Lee, and I am an alcoholic. Good afternoon. Thanks for coming back. We love you dearly. Let's, uh, let's open with a few moments of silence, if you would. I always like to invite God to the meeting. Amen. Thank you. Continuing on uh, step four, we are uh, at the top of page, actually at the bottom of page 67, we realized the people who wronged us were perhaps spiritually sick. This is the beginning of the forgiveness process, which is contained in step four, which you probably won't find if all you do is write. And it says, though we did not like their symptoms, the way these disturbed us, they, like ourselves, were sick too. And then here is uh, the first of several prayers in step four. We ask God to help us show them the same tolerance, pity, and patience that we would cheerfully grant a sick friend. Um, I have very prayerfully approached this. Most of my teachers got sober on the second edition. Um, but I refer to the back of the book as the God will constantly disclose more to you and to us. And on, on page 552, there's an interesting prayer that I, that I find useful, and I think it's in that category. We're going to start at the bottom of 551. The lady's talking about a resentment against her mother, and she says, One morning, however, I realized I had to get rid of it. That's a, re, that's a resentment against her mother. From my reprieve, if you look up reprieve, it's a stay of execution. This is another death threat. We try to keep them coming. Uh, my reprieve was running out if I didn't get... And if I didn't get rid of it, I was going to get drunk, and I didn't want to get drunk anymore. My prayers that morning, I asked God to point out to me some way to be free of this resentment. During the day, a friend of mine brought me some magazines to take to a hospital group I was interested in. I looked through them, a banner across one feature, an article by a prominent clergyman in which I caught the word resentment. Before I go on, I want to observe the sequence of events, because I believe that this is a predictable sequence of events. I see something about me that needs work. Not something's wrong with me. There's nothing wrong with us. We're God's kids. There are things that need work. I pray about it. I like to add in that I talk to a spiritual advisor of some kind. And then what she did was she got focused helping somebody else. I don't know what kind of a hospital group this was, but she's out of herself going to help somebody else, and her answer falls out of the sky on her. That is a predictable sequence of events. And I love it when I see it in somebody I sponsor. I always point out, I said, hey, it happened again. Right? You prayed about it. You talked to me. You took a meeting into the jail. When you came out, your answer was laying on the hood of your car. It happens over and over and over again. Continuing, he says, he said, in effect, if you have a resentment you want to be free of, that's an interesting question. Do you want to be free? Did we make our sale? We killed you seven times. Are you willing to pay the price? Because it's high. If you will pray for the person or thing you resent, you'll be free. If you'll ask in prayer for everything you want to be for yourself to be given to them, you'll be free for their happiness, their health, their prosperity. And you will be free even when you don't really want it for them and your prayers are only words and you don't mean it, go ahead and do it anyway. That goes on to say that will work in two weeks. Uh, you're starting out with 409 resentments. Probably two weeks is a little bit on the optimistic side. Um, I think the shortest resentment list I ever saw I thought was complete was around 40. It was a young man, and he just wasn't very mad. The longest one I ever saw was over 600, and it was incomplete. This guy hated everybody, and he wished there was more of them. I, I, I had never seen anybody in love with hate like this guy was. Um, so what I like to do with this is I like to add those two together. And it, as I observe that, this prayer in 67, I ask God to help me show them tolerance, pity, and patience like I would grant a sick friend. And then on the other prayer, I'm praying for them. So it would look something like this. I'm, the guy is continuing with 30-minute sessions beginning in the first five minutes talking about the worst things he's ever done. He spends the next 25 minutes in prayer. In addition, I want you to pray in the shower, drive in the car, whenever you think about them, day or night. Let's stay in prayer over this thing. And uh, so the prayer might go something like this. First name on the list, Fred. God help me show Fred the same tolerance, pity, and patience I would cheerfully grant a sick friend. And also pray that, uh, that Fred's hair doesn't fall out. And that he gets promoted at work. That his kids go to school on scholarship. Uh, that his wife is fabulous in bed, that his lawn grows lush and green, but it grows so slowly he only has to mow it once a year. Okay, hang it right out over the edge. I don't think you can be too creative on this one. And then afterward, I, I say you ask yourself a simple question. Do I mean that? That's not an essay question. That's a yes or no. You either mean that or you don't. 
If you don't mean it, go to the next name. Don't stay there. If you do mean it, put a check mark in the margin and go to the next name. And when we get to the end of the list, we'll start again with the ones that aren't checked. And we're going to do this until you're finished, and I really couldn't care any less how long it takes. I'm working with a guy right now that's got about 10 years, has never done the book. And uh, he's down to three, having started with a couple of, around 300 about five months ago. I don't care how long this takes. I, I don't know of anything more important that we do. There, there's, a, there's a prayer that we pray at the end of a lot of meetings in my part of the world, actually all over the country, um, that has a phrase in it. And the phrase is, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive. And I believe what that says is, if I don't forgive them, don't you forgive me. My sponsor said, what you really want is mercy for you and justice for everybody else. And the package is mercy for everybody or justice for everybody. And you are part of everybody and you get to choose. I'm not in a position to face justice. So I've chosen mercy for everybody. And to me, this, this approach, uh, as I said earlier, and I believe the English language has it wrong. Sure does in my case. Forgive isn't something I do, it's something I receive. I get here locked up like this, and what you've taught me to do is to open to receive the gifts that have always been here. It's never been God's unwillingness to give. It's been my inability to receive that's been the problem. And I think of resentment as ice around my heart. And what I do with these two prayers combined is I hold the icy heart up to the sunlight of the Spirit. And the ice has a thickness, I think, based on the severity of the events, how long ago they were, uh, how much I've nurtured them. And, and the sunlight will always melt ice. And maybe the time period has to do with how close I can hold it and how long. I don't know the answer to any of those questions. I know this. This works. Uh, there's a wonderful workshop a man that I sponsor does um, on going through the forgiveness process for the man that killed his son. This is some powerful stuff. All right? Don't discount this. Um, so forgive isn't something I do. It's something I receive. And what, what this process did for me was it opened me up to receive the gift of not hating you anymore. You come to me and tell me you want to be close friends with me and us to be really close, but by the way, you hate my children. That's not going to work, is it? Now I'm going to God and saying I want to be close to you, but meanwhile I'm going to hate some of your children? That package doesn't make any sense to me. And so this, for me, is the forgiveness process. And I say, if we, if we do something more important than this, I don't know what it is. This, this is beyond, this is just somewhat more important than life or death. That's my experience with it. And my experience is that it works. And it works every time. It takes some time. This particular guy, and I have his permission to talk to you, this particular guy prayed his list two and a half times before he checked off the first name. That's not unusual. I don't care. I've been nurturing these things for a long time. We're digging the poison out of your soul. That's not poetry. That's the exact de description of what we do here. And this is where it happens, between the third and fourth columns of the resentment inventory. And then... Um, uh, continuing at the top of 67, gives me my marching orders from now on. When a person offended, we said to ourselves, this is a sick man, how can I be helpful to him? Here's another prayer. God save me from being angry, thy will be done. That's what I do when you bug me now. And then it says we avoid retaliation or argument. We wouldn't treat sick people that way. If we do, we destroy our chance of being helpful. Interesting, page 77 at the top. For those of you who read the big book regularly, you'll laugh when I say you have to read it all the time to catch all the new stuff. Because, you know, they sneak into your bedroom and they change it. They add some stuff. They added this about two and a half years ago, for those of you who may have missed it. Now, those of you who are new, they don't rewrite the big book, but we read it with new eyes. And uh, third line, 77, our real purpose to fit ourselves to be a maximum service to God and the people about us. And I understood for the longest time that I was supposed to be a maximum service to God and the people about me. And that's not what it says at all. It's to fit myself. It's for me to do the work on me as best I can. To go through this forgiveness process. To be available. To stay as cleaned out as I can. So I can be the best tool. His job to use me. My job is to keep the tool sharp. Continuing on 67. Here's another powerful promise. We cannot be helpful to all people. At least God will show us how to take a kindly and tolerant view of each and every one. Is that a promise? My goodness. That's all these people we hated. 
And Bob covered it so beautifully, putting on, referring to our list and putting out of our minds the wrongs others had done. I can't do that if I still hate them, by the way. How am I going to do that if I still hate them? I don't think it's possible to think about somebody I still hate and put out of my mind what they did. So it's important for me to go through this forgiveness process first and get that piece of poison dug out of my soul. We resolutely look for our own mistakes, not our part. Uh, that's a terrible thing. Not looking for my part at all. I'm looking for my mistakes. Because if I've gone through this forgiveness process, nobody else has a part. All we have left is my mistake. Where had we been selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, and frightened? Those are the earmarks of the emergence of self. Selfish, I want it my way. Dishonest, I don't care if I have to lie to get it my way. Self-seeking, very similar to selfish. Frightened, I'm afraid I may not get my way. It's, it's the reemergence of self. And that list is all over this book. And I'm going to hit just a couple of the places. Page 84, about 10 or 12 lines from the bottom in the 10th step inventory. And we'll touch on this a little bit later. Continue to watch for selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. That sounds familiar. Top of 86, when we retired night, constructively reorvey, were we resentful, selfish, dishonest, or afraid? There's a similar list. Here's one at the top of page 88. We are then in much less danger of excitement, fear, anger, worry, self-pity, or foolish decisions. A somewhat different list, but very similar. Page 145. Am I going fast enough? <laughs> Page 145. Where is that lady that did that? Right yes, thank you. We have enemies. They're described very clearly on page 145. Paragraph begins in the middle of the page. The greatest enemies of us alcoholics are resentment, jealousy, envy, frustration, and fear. Not the exact same list, but very, very close. And those are all the earmarks of the reemergence of self. It always comes back to self. Continuing on 67, uh, it tells us twice to disregard what they say, and then I look for, for my mistakes. And, um, and I love this thing at the, on the last sentence. We admitted our wrongs honestly, and we're willing to set these matters straight. Gee, that sounds like step eight, doesn't it? Yeah, very much so. And then... Um, I'm going to leave some of this for Bob, but we indict fear in the next paragraph. Generally speaking, it's not a good thing. And um, on page 68, it says we reviewed our fears thoroughly. We put them on paper, even though we had no resentment connection with them. What that tells me is that I have some fears that have resentment connected, and then I have some that don't. I kind of got two categories. I can find some of them by reviewing the resentment inventory. Others I may need some help with. Um, and I have what I have them do in the, in the spiral notebook is turn five or six pages, make a big dog ear so you can find it, so you can add the other resentments as you find them. And then let's have a list of fears. Now, I've got some very close friends who come up with a four-column inventory out of, out of this part of it. Uh, you know what? I missed something on the page before, didn't I? Yo, excuse me. Let's go back to 67. This paragraph begins with referring to our list again, putting in our mind we look for our own uh, I'm looking for my mistakes. I like to use that for a fourth column. And there's not much room over there. you got a half a page, two lines, all you got left. So it's, this is not a big, long, written, beat-me-up kind of thing. I'm just looking for my mistakes. So let's put them down. What did I do wrong? Uh, next to she girl left me for another guy. Well, I was seeing some other girls myself and got caught. Uh, maybe that's partially my fault. The uh, professor that gave me the bad grades. Um, well, I didn't study and I didn't show up for class that much. He didn't actually give me the grade. I earned it. High school football coach didn't play me as much as I said I deserved. Well, I go back and look at it. When I went to practice, I didn't practice very hard. In addition to which, there were other guys in that position that played better than I did. Now, you got to go back and look at the truth on these things. I don't have to like it. I do have to look at it. So, for me, that's the fourth column. I'm, I'm glad we picked that back up. Uh, continuing here on page 68. Even though we had no resentment connection, we asked ourselves why we had them. I'm so grateful they tell me. I had no idea why I had fears. No idea. Wasn't it because self-reliance failed us? And I, I, what I asked them to do is to go down your fear list and ask yourself a question one at a time. If I were totally God-reliant, would I have this fear? It's a good question. And I think that will show you that it is self-reliance that generates the fears. Next paragraph, perhaps there is a better way. We think so. We're now on a different basis. Basis of trusting and relying upon God that seemed redundant to me. Roman numeral 16, forward to the second edition. One of the most powerful concepts I found in this book, and it just screamed at me one day. 
uh, for those of you who brought your book, uh, we're pretty close to the front, and it's his second or third edition XBI. Bill Wilson's about to leave, leave the Oxford groups, and he's not taking everything they got, but he's taking some of it. About ten lines from the top, though he could not accept all the tenets of the Oxford groups, he was convinced of the need for moral inventory, confession of personality defects, restitution of those harmed, which might be different from an apology, helpfulness to others, and listen to this last phrase, and the necessity, I wonder if that's important, the necessity of belief in and dependence upon God. And the thing that strikes me on that is it's possible to believe in God and not have a higher power. And that dependence for me is the difference. Belief in God and dependence upon God are separate concepts. And that's what we're talking about here. Back on 68. Basis of trusting and relying upon God. We trust infinite God rather than our finite selves. We're in the world to play the role He assigns. Step one, section B, my life's unmanageable. I'm here to play the role God assigns. And I love the analogy that God created a particular animal and He gave that animal a taste only for the leaves that grow at the top of a particular kind of tree. And he also gave the giraffe a long neck so he could get to them. I have a long neck for God's will for me. I am designed for it. But I, I had to get the poison out. I had to get the self out of the way first so that that could happen. Just to the extent that we do as we think he would have us and humbly rely on him, does he enable us to match calamity with serenity? Just as I do as I think he would have me, I don't always know. Don't always know what God wants me to do. But if I'm trying to do what I think he wants me to do next, I still make mistakes, but I make a finer quality mistake than I've ever made before in my life. And that is, in fact, what progress is. All of my life, they've been telling me, we learn from our mistakes. Not so. If we learn from our mistakes, how did Alcoholics Anonymous possibly form? Hmm? I don't learn from my mistakes, never did. What I learn from is living with the results of my mistakes. We got five steps out of 12 that address that. Four, five, eight, nine, and ten are all about me embracing the results of my mistakes, and that's where the learning occurs. I'm like, the, I'm like the dog that wets on the rug. What did he learn? Absolutely nothing. When did he start learning? When you rubbed his nose in it. Me and the dog have that in common. We like to have our noses rubbed in it because that's where I learn. And as I insist upon living with the results of my mistakes, I was told that's what freedom is. Freedom isn't getting away with it. Freedom is when I gleefully embrace the results of all of my own decisions and actions. I'm free to do anything I'm prepared to live with the results of. That's what freedom is. And that's what this is about, is me taking responsibility for my own actions. That's what this is about. That's how I get free. And the next time I'm in a similar situation and, it's, and I'm about to do something that's going to get me in trouble, do I think, oh, that's a mistake? No, that's not what I think. I think, did you enjoy making amends last time you did something like this? I hate amends worse than communism. I got no interest in doing amends. I don't like amends at all. So I think I'll just keep my mouth shut this time, and then I won't have to do amends. And that's where the learning occurs for me. Um, I've discovered something for me, and that's I have discovered the source of all anger for me. Anger for me comes from being right. I have never been angry when I wasn't also right. I have been right when I wasn't angry. But I hadn't been angry when I wasn't right. If I'm angry with you in traffic, I'm right. You shouldn't be driving that way. And it, it, wh wherever it occurs, when I'm angry, it's because I'm right. And my being right is based on my judgment. And it comes back to me getting out of the judgment business. When I get out of the judgment business, I don't get mad. I think everybody has a good motive. Somebody asked Al Capone one time why he was involved in drugs and prostitution and gambling and illegal alcohol and all those things. He said, I was just trying to get people the things they wanted. Al Capone had a good motive. Okay? That's why guys like me got to get out of the motive business, because I'm fully capable of that. That's why I got to stay involved in principle. But when I grant that you have a good motive, right, if you're all the way on one side politically, if you will grant that the people on the other side have good motive, you don't have to be angry with them anymore. It gave me a tremendous freedom. I disagree with the principles, but I'm not angry with them anymore. What a gift. What a gift, because I'm free. I got free. This sentence is permission to make a mistake. Just the extent we do as we think he would have us. I don't always know. It's okay that I make mistakes. That's my job. It's my assignment. In my own particular religious beliefs, the job of being perfect is already taken. Somebody's got that. 
There's not like an address where I can mail a resume, get interviewed, now I can be perfect. If it's not my job to be perfect, is it not logically my job to make mistakes? And I'm good at it, right? And the learning process occurs for me as I live with the results of those mistakes. Because I believe the mistakes and the lessons are paired. If I had the lesson, I wouldn't have made the mistake. The reason I made the mistake is it points me at a lesson. And when I get that lesson, I don't always get it the first time. But when I get that lesson, my next assignment is to make the next mistake. It should be a better one than the last one. My mistakes are getting better and better. I've got my buddy Chainsaw Mike. Y'all get it one of his CDs. Chainsaw Mike says I got Cadillac problems. <laughs> you know that's right. That the better mistakes I make today, the better problems I have tomorrow. Because that's where they all come from. So here's permission to make a mistake. At the Alanine side of that is if I got a string on you holding you in line and you jump out, you pull me with you. When I can let go of that string and it becomes okay with me that you make mistakes. That's the other half of the freedom. That's my experience with it. Continuing on 68, we never, that's not very often, we never apologize to anyone for depending on our Creator. It tells me that twice and that men of faith has courage. I'm kind of skipping down a little bit. It says they trust their God. We never apologize for God. We let Him demonstrate through us what He can do. We ask Him, aha, this looks like a prayer to me. Four steps, a series of lists, observations, and prayers. The list, I don't, writing the list, I don't know that has any effect at all. The observations, a few of which are written, most are not, and the prayers are life-changing. We ask him to remove our fear and direct our attention to what he would have us do. And boy, is that ever not what that says. What he would have us be. Yeah, be, not do. And I wonder, well, what would he have me be? Well, I found the answer. It's in the book, 133. Third line, we are sure God wants us to be. Happy, joyous, and free. And I think anything that I can add to that list that fits is within the Master's will for me. Happy, joyous, free, and trying to be a good father. Yep. Yep. Happy, joyous, free, and letting people in in traffic. Yeah, I think so. Happy, joyous, free, and, and attending a lot of AA meetings. Yeah. Happy, joyous, free, and cheating on my taxes. <clears throat> Ouch. Try it. <laughs> My, uh, my mentor, Don, used to say, if he was unsure whether or not to do something, he'd pray this prayer. God, if I go to do this, will you go with me? <coughs> Boy, don't pray that if you don't want the answer. <laughs> you will get it. And then it says, it says that once we commence to outgrow fear. It seems to me that if it's possible for me to outgrow fear, fear must be a lack of growth. I'm going to guess spiritual growth. I'll tell a fear story. A lady friend of mine in Nashville, been in recovery a long time, was standing in line in a bank to cash a check. And all of a sudden, there was a hairy arm around her throat and a pistol in her ear. And she's a hostage in a bank robbery. She talked about it later, and she said all of her fears were in the future. That as she stood there moment by moment, she was not free to go about her business. She was physically a bit uncomfortable. But her fear was that he would abduct her or that he would shoot her. But if she could have stayed in the moment, moment by moment, she was really okay. Crystallized it for me. Anytime I'm in fear, I'm in the future. Anytime. And, and so, so what's the answer to that? The answer to that isn't to don't be afraid. For me, the answer to that is to get into today. I, I learned this from Bob a couple of years ago. We were doing one of these. And, and how it works, there's this marvelous phrase. There's one who has all power. May you find him now. Bob said, now isn't when I find God, it's where. I have to be here where he is. So how do I do that? This is an assignment I give to guys that I sponsor that are having trouble with that. I have them take big sheets of paper. With a big magic marker, write the word today. Want one on top of the socks in the sock drawer, one on the underwear. Want one on the mirror where you shave, one on the dashboard of your car. you got a screensaver at work. I want today bouncing around there. Uh, let's cut two the size of dollar bills, one on the inside, one on the outside, they say today. And I want you to use that word as much as you can, not only in your speech, but also in your prayers and especially in your thoughts. See, my disease isn't very creative. It keeps hitting me with the same old junk. And when it hits me with one of those... They're always the what-ifs, you know, chasing the, the permutations in the future. When it hits me with one of those, if I tag the word today onto the end of the question, it takes all the power away. Right? It's not what am I going to do if rat tat 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 It's what am I going to do if today. If I can get the today word into that, it takes all the power away. And it helps me stay here, which is where I need to be. Fear is an evil and corroding threat. The other thing I wanted to talk about is acceptance. Um, it was explained to me that I did not have to approve of something to accept it. 
Acceptance does not, it can, but it doesn't have to include approval. If anybody here was abused as a child, I want to tell you right now that I do not approve of that. I think that's a terrible thing, and I'm sorry that you had to go through that, and it wasn't right, and it's not ever going to be right. No child deserves that. You didn't deserve it. It's not right. It's just not right. But I've learned to accept that that happened to me. What acceptance means is that on a heart level, I have quit fighting something over which I have no power. That doesn't mean I'm inviting evil in. It doesn't mean if somebody's bashing me, I don't have to defend myself in some way. It means that I need to quit fighting those things over which I have no power. That's what acceptance is. It's when I let go of those things and just be at peace. There was a... I read a book a number of years ago, and I'm sorry I can't call I think it was entitled King Baby. And it was written by a... Uh, this guy was a Ph.D. psychologist, psychiatrist, uh, one or the other, and he was uh, also an ordained minister in one of the mainline Protestant faiths, Presbyterian Methodist, somewhere along in there. And um, he was the chaplain of an insane asylum. And he got a wild hair one day. I'm not sure that's exactly how the book presented it. but And, and he inventoried the patients and asked them one question. Would you rather be right or would you rather be free? And the inmates of the insane asylum overwhelmingly said they would rather be right. And you know, back when I was nuts, I would have rather been right also. And today I would rather be free. And I'm convinced in my case that those are exact and perfect opposites. Right and free are opposites. Because when I have to be right, I can't make mistakes. When I, when I, if I make a mistake, I have to beat me up. And it gets ugly. And beating me up is never the next right thing, ever, no matter what, because there's always a lesson there. Today I've chosen free. I get out of the business of being right, and what I get is a sense of peace. I get to just kind of be okay with me. See, my priority isn't what I say it is. My priority is what I do. If I want to know what my priorities are, I don't listen to my words about the future. I look at my actions in the recent past. What was accomplished was a priority. What was not accomplished was not a priority. And anything that I say to the contrary is a lie that I'm telling me. I hated that when I heard that five years sober at the mustard seed in Chicago. Hated it. Because I was saying a bunch of things were priorities and I wasn't doing anything about them. Priority is about what I do. So if I want to know where I am, what my priorities are, I look at my actions over the last few days. I've got three things I call my spiritual barometers. At two years sober, I was working on my character defects. That's a good way to get a brain hernia. And uh, anyway, working on my character defects is driving me crazy. And I, I located three I couldn't do anything with. And they were lying, well, not actually lying, improving the truth, actually. Uh, just around the edges to make it prettier. Um, lying, uh, swearing. And uh, my attitude toward those of you who got your driver's licenses out of Cracker Jack's boxes. And um, what I discovered eventually was that if one of those got out, if I'd looked, they were all out. See, and I can't work. I can't stop them. I, I can't. Uh, I can't stop me from swearing, right? I guess duct tape can't stop me from lying. I can't change my attitude towards you. But I believe this: when my spiritual house is in order, those things aren't a problem. So when I hear me angry and cussing at you in traffic, I don't work on that. What I do is I inventory my spiritual program over the last few days. How long has it been since I talked to my sponsor? How long has it been since I talked to my sponsees? When's the last time you took a meeting into a jail or a treatment center? What's your, the one that gets out of me is what's your morning and prayer and meditation look like? Do you still hold that commitment? What's your evening prayer? Are you reading your spiritual? Are you, where's the hole in your spiritual bucket? Something's leaking. And I go back and plug that hole, and two days later you can cut me off in traffic and almost hit me. And I'll smile at you from the depths of my soul, and I'll wave my entire hand at you. I'll wave the whole thing. And... Uh, they don't do that around here. And I'll say, God, go with that one, you know. And, and thank you that I saw he was going to cut me off and get on my break. And I wasn't in a wreck. It would have been his fault, but I'm still in a wreck. Thank you so much. And God bless that child. I make mistakes like that, too. And I hope the next guy that I do that, too, can forgive me like I do this guy. God bless him. I can't change me from the screaming maniac. I can't change me. But when I go back and plug the holes in my spiritual bucket, those things just don't happen. Thanks, Scott. I'm Bob, an alcoholic. Hey, Bob. Heard a guy years ago say there's only two driving forces in human nature, fear and love. And as I go through this inventory, I start to see how much a part of my life fear was. Um, when I saw it, fear was involved in every resentment, 
And when we get to the sex inventory, we'll see that it's, it's involved deeply in that. Um, I started to realize what, what it means when it says we're driven by a hundred forms of fear. And yet, when I, I remember sitting down at the kitchen table with a legal pad, and I'm going to do my first out-of-the-book legitimate inventory, and I'm trying to write. I just finished my resentments, and I'm trying to write fears, and I'm sitting there, and I'm drawing a blank. I can't think of anything I'm afraid of. And I went to a, a meeting, the end of a monthly speaker meeting. We had a speaker there from out of town, and a bunch of us went out to eat after the meeting to pie shop and sitting in this restaurant. I'm talking to this old timer, and I said, you know, I'm doing an inventory, and I got to the fear inventory, and I realized I don't have any fears. And he said, really? I said, yeah, I don't have any fears. He said, can I ask you some questions? I said, yeah, sure. He said, are you afraid of large, angry, barking dogs? <laughs> well... Everybody is. And he says, we're not talking about everybody. We're talking about you. And I said, well, yeah. He says, good, you can put that down. Are you afraid of rattlesnakes? Well, I mean, everybody's afraid of rattlesnakes, for God's sake. He says, but we're talking about you. He says, black widow spiders. And I'm nodding my head. Then he starts getting a little personal. He says, are you afraid of being embarrassed? Are you afraid of what other people think of you? Are you afraid that no one will ever love you? Are you afraid of dying old alone? Are you afraid of getting sick and you can't take care of yourself? Are you afraid that people are going to find out stuff about you that you don't want anybody to know about? Are you afraid that you'll never have a good life because you've hurt so many people that you know it's going to catch up with you? Are you afraid to really trust God because you've hurt so many of his kids? Are you afraid of getting, are you afraid of cancer? I, I God, when he said that one, I just, I, I had cancer every other week in my early, I don't know how many thousands of deathbed speeches I've rehearsed in my head when I, when I find out it's, oh, it wasn't a brain tumor, it was a headache. Oh, all right. Uh, uh, and all the people, are you afraid of, what about all the people you hurt? Are you afraid that's going to catch up with you? And on and on and on. And then he finally, after hammering me with this, he finally says, so uh, was there anything you weren't afraid of? And I thought, my God, how did that happen? The book says it's an evil and, th an evil and corroding thread. The fabric of my existence was shot through with it. I can't see fear because I'm like a fish looking for water. It is the motivating aspect of self that dominates me and drives my life. And I can't see it because it is, an, it, I have, it is me. It has consumed me. It's funny how I would, I, we, you know, when Silkworth in the doctor's opinion says something that is, has come through my whole life, he says, to us, our alcoholic life seems the only normal one. You take the alcohol away, and I start thinking it's normal to wake up afraid. Normal to wake up anxious and apprehensive about life. Normal to worry and spin in my head about stuff all the time. As if normal equals neurotic, right? But to me, my alcoholic life seems the only normal one. And I found out that I was so full of fear. And, and then it, the next line is, is, a, is an interesting statement. It says that, it's talking about fears, and it says it sets in motion trains of circumstances which brought us misfortune we felt we didn't deserve, but did not we ourselves set the ball rolling. What does that mean? Well... When I was new in sobriety, I heard a guy say, he said, you know, I've never had a problem in my life that has hurt me as much as my solutions to my problems. Psychologists call this self-fulfilling prophecies. And what is it? I get a fear. And then I try to manage the fear. And what happens is I make the fear come true. 
give you I'll give you an example. My first sober relationship. I get into it. I, I have no I have no self esteem yet. I've not made all my amends. I don't I haven't spent a dozen years sponsoring people and doing service. So I haven't really done anything to change my relationship with me yet. Or my relationship with God or you, really. So what am I bringing to the table except a big vacancy? And a lot of ang- and a lot of feelings of inadequacy and a lot of not enoughness. That's all I got. Don't make me a bad guy. It's just all I got. I haven't done the work consistently and lived differently to be differently. It's all I got. So I come to the table in this relationship with a fear. What's the fear? Well, the fear is that she's going to dump me. Right. So what happens? The fear drives me. It drives me to be the possessive, smothering guy. It drives me to be watching her all the time. It drives me to be the guy who drives by her house in the middle of the night just to make sure nobody else's car is there. It drives me to that when she hugs somebody in the meeting, I'm going, hey, I pull the guy aside after the meeting, hey, don't be hugging my girlfriend. People are looking at me like I'm a whack job, man. When she leaves the room, I look through her purse, make sure there's no guy's cards in there. Right. She said to me one time, she says, every time I'm in a meeting with you and I look up, you're looking at me. I don't even know I'm doing it. Right? I don't even know I'm doing it. And what happened? My fear of her leaving me drove me to be the guy who literally would push her out of my life. And I remember the day... That it was the day after it was over, and she's now off with some other guy, and I am—I feel like I've been gut shot, and I wished I was dead, and my whole life is crumbling around me because she was, unbeknownst to me, became my higher power, right? And in the middle of that desolation, and it's horrible. There's a little voice that I can hear in my head that I've come to identify with my ego, and the little voice says. See, you were right. I like being right. Devastated, about ready to drink, but right for God's sakes. <laughs> I've lost jobs like that because I've gone to work and made... And what are my fears but judgments? The ego says, you don't like me. I can tell by looking at you. So what happens is I don't like you first. <laughs> Right? And if I don't like you first long enough, you know what happens? You end up not liking me. Right? See, I was right. I was right. You know, I was right. That's why in the next line it says, sometimes we think fear ought to be classed with stealing. It seems to cause more harm. Nothing will rob you of love, intimacy, abundance, richness in your life more than self-centered fear. It will di- you will discount yourself, you will discount life, and you will discount God's grace in your life continually. And as, as life is presenting you with opportunities for abundance, your fear will tell you, bat it right away. Because you, your fear tells you no. I sat with an old guy one time. He was dying of natural causes. He was sober a long time, a guy named Rusty. And we're sitting next to his bed, and he was a cool guy. And Rusty said to me, he says, well, he says, kid, you know, when you get to the home stretch and you look back over your life, he says, oddly enough, it's not my mistakes I regret as much as the things I was too afraid to try. The people I was afraid to love and let close because I was afraid you wouldn't like me. So I'm not going to like you first. My, My sponsor, who I've had now for 15 years, my first 10 years of my sobriety, maybe 12 even, I, I resented him. And I, I, you know, when, do you ever notice when you have a resentment, from the moment you make the judgment about the person that resentment, it changes your perception. Now they can't do anything right. They just can't. You know what I mean? Because you're looking at them like that. They can't do it. And I, and I just got to, the ego wants the case. You have to be justified. The, hey, you got to justify, 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 justify. And what was the bottom line? Why didn't I? Why did I build all these cases against him? Because I was afraid he wouldn't like me. I was afraid I wouldn't measure up to his standard in Alcoholics Anonymous. He, and he cuts a high standard. So I discounted him first. I threw him away. 
because I was afraid he would throw me away. Nothing will rob you more than fear. There are things in my life I love today that at one time I, I discounted and judged harshly because I was afraid. I, I love, one of the things I love to do, I travel all over the world doing it, is uh, scuba diving. Somebody offered to, to ask me if I want to go with them and learn how to do that when I was new in sobriety. Oh, I wouldn't like that. I'm just afraid of the learning curve. I'm afraid I'll look stupid. Somebody asked me if I want to go snow skiing when I was a couple years sober. Oh, I'm going to like that. Snow bunnies, ah, that's the fact. I love snow skiing. I was afraid of looking stupid, right? I'm willing to start at anything right at the top. But I don't, that's why I loved alcohol. Alcohol, you don't have to do nothing. You just, you know, you don't have to go to school to be a doctor. You just have five drinks in a bar. You're a brain surgeon. You know, I mean, you don't have to do nothing. You could just, you just, you just make leaps. You know, fear is awful. And it, the the book says we reviewed our fears thoroughly. We put them on paper. So I'm listing all the. People I'd harm that I'm afraid of, of the retribution and the karma, or the people finding out. I'm listing all the people, all my creditors, all the people I owe money for. Because later on in the ninth step, it says we must lose our fear, our fear of creditors, no matter what, how far we have to go, because we're liable to drink if we're afraid to face them. So I list all this stuff down, and, and then there's a question, it's, and it's a, I think it's a, a paramount question because I'm. Unbeknownst to me at this point, unless I've read ahead, I am creating, I'm building also an eight-step list. The book later says you already have it. You made it, you ha made it when you took inventory. So I'm building an eight-step list. And so the, the question is we ask ourselves why we had these fears. And I think that's an important question. I'm afraid of uh, Joe from down across town, that other group. Why are you afraid of him? I, I don't know. I just feel anxious when I'm around him. I just, it makes me uncomfortable. Why do you have the fear? Could it be because you talk crap behind his back when he's not around? And maybe you're afraid somebody might have heard it and now he might know. I'm afraid of the IRS. Could it be because I cheat on my taxes? I, I'm, I was afraid of smoking cigarettes. Uh, why? Because I might get cancer. Why do I have these fears? I'm afraid of, I'm afraid of visa. I'm afraid of all kinds of stuff. And a lot of times in, in answering that question, I will come upon an unmade amends. Because mend, amends is simply mending. Mending things. It's, it's unfinished business between me and God's kids, and between me and life itself. Alcoholism is a state of separation between separate from me and you, separate from me and God. And the mending is the accumulation of a process to, that reduces the separation and brings me back to a sense of community and oneness. So I make this list. Um, the book asks, I ask the question. The book comes around and answers the question in a general way. It says, wasn't it because self-reliance failed us? And that's always true. That's the bottom line in every case. Uh, that's, that's the thing is, is it see of an of myself, I'm not enough. I can't protect myself from my fears. As a matter of fact, the, the harder I try, the worse I get. Um, some of us once had great self-confidence, but it didn't fully solve the fear problem or any other. When it made us cocky, it was worse. Boy, that's really true. Uh, I think there's that people respond to fear one of two ways, usually. Some people respond to fear like a skunk, and when they're afraid, they spray everybody around them. Other people respond to fear like a turtle, and they pull their head into their shell, and they wait until whatever they're afraid of passes. I came here a skunk, and you've gradually turned me into a turtle. A turtle, I'll tell you why a turtle's better. Turtle makes less amends. <laughs> skunk is always making amends always making amends and you taught me how to be a turtle by the 10th step in the 12 by 12 when the cultivation of restraint of tongue and pen 
that not to react but learn to act, take spiritual actions when I'm afraid. Trust God. Talk to my sponsor. Keep my mouth shut. Go to a meeting. Take actions rather than reactions. Um, when it was made, it was cocky. It was worse. Perhaps there's a better way. Boy, I hope so. <laughs> we think so, for we are now on a different basis. What basis is that? Remember step three. Remember the decision, the formal terms of surrender. We're on a different basis. We're on the basis of trusting and relying upon God. This is our destination. From the moment of decision in step three, that becomes my destination. It becomes the basis of my life. To trust and rely upon God. We trust infinite God rather than our finite selves. This is more than faith. I was at a retreat 28 years ago, I suppose, and 27, 28 years ago, and I was talking to a guy between the sessions, and it was an old timer, sober a long time, and, and I was telling him what was going on with me. And I was telling him how I get up in the morning and I get down on my knees and I turn my will and my life over to the care of God and I spend the rest of the day worrying about stuff. And it was wearing on me, and I was tired of it. I was tired of that, that feeling right here of a wind blowing through the pit of my stomach from that anxiety. And he said to me, he, he, said, he said, well, he said, do you, you pray, and do you, you believe in God? Do you have faith? I said, yeah, I know I'm sober now longer, and I've been probably my whole life. And God did that. He said, but you don't, I don't think you trust God. He said, you have faith. He said, guys like you and I, we can pray fervently and have all the faith in the world and still die of alcoholism. And I have later saw that come true. I saw exactly what he meant as I watched some people with tremendous faith die of alcoholism. He said, what we must have is trust. And he says, I'll tell you the difference. He says, if you went to a circus and you sat in the audience and you watched a tight wire act and you watched a guy come out to the edge of the wire on the platform pushing a wheelbarrow, you could sit in the audience and have all the faith in the world. He's a professional. This guy can walk across that tight wire pushing that wheelbarrow. You'd say to yourself, I bet she's done it a thousand times. Absolute faith he can do it. But if you had trust, you'd go up and get in the wheelbarrow. And when he said that to me, I got this sinking feeling in the pit of my stomach because I knew what he was talking about. In other words, I have to stop worrying about Bob and stop defending Bob, protecting Bob, doing for Bob, and really live my life as if I was in the hands of God. I have to get in the wheelbarrow. And the problem with that is I, I like the concept of getting in the wheelbarrow. I like to go to meetings and read about getting in the wheelbarrow. I like to go out to coffee with people and philosophize about getting in the wheelbarrow. I like to go to discussion meetings and discuss getting in the wheelbarrow. I just ain't getting in the wheelbarrow. You know what I'm saying? I, because I secretly believe my fears more than I trust God. Push comes to shove. I believe my fear. I trust my fears more than I trust God. Now, it doesn't make me a bad guy. It makes me burdened by a tremendous spiritual handicap. But it doesn't make me a bad guy. So what do you do if you can't get in the wheelbarrow? What do you do if secretly in the pit of your stomach, your emotional response is such that if you ever did get in the wheelbarrow, you are absolutely convinced. You get about halfway out that wire, you hear a voice go, is that Bob? <laughs> and you just, the, just terrified. Like, is that Bob that used to read National Geographic and have those impure thoughts when he was a kid? Is that that Bob? You know, and what do you do? Well, page 53 is really what has happened to me in sobriety. And it's, this is what happens to a lot of us, I guess. Uh, it says, when we became alcoholics, crushed by self-imposed crisis, I could not postpone or evade. I had to fearlessly face the proposition through a lack of alternatives. I had to fearlessly face the proposition that God is either everything or else he is nothing. He either is or he isn't. What is my choice to be? I have had times in my sobriety 
where I was crushed by self-imposed crises. I did this. It's coming at me. I can't fix it. I can't maneuver. I can't think my way out of it. And I'm screwed. And there's either a God that they're telling me about that really exists that's got my back or I am in a lot of trouble. When I was early in sobriety, I, I was facing two years in a state penitentiary. And a guy in AA walked me through it was the hardest thing I've ever do. I had to turn my – I'd I'd been sentenced in Pennsylvania. A judge cut me a break, put me in a treatment center for a year to get – for observation and get good UAs, and I had to do all that stuff. So – and if I could do a year in there, I wouldn't be a felony. And if I didn't, it was a felony in two years in prison. It was automatic. I was already committed. He just stayed the commitment. And I, when I drank again and split there and crossed all those state lines from Pennsylvania to Nevada and came to – and I am sober and in Alcoholics Anonymous, this fear is like on me. And this guy in AA told me, you have to turn yourself in. And I thought he was crazy. I said, I'll do two years in prison, plus probably some tack on time for splitting. He said, kid, do you want to die of alcoholism? And I said, no. He said, you want to stay sober? Yeah. He said, well, how long are you going to stay sober Looking over your shoulder, every time a cop car goes down the street, your gut just seizes up because he, you don't know if he's got your picture on his dashboard or not. How long are you going to be able to go like that kid before you're going to have to take something or drink something just to survive the feelings of anxiety? And he nailed me because I know what he's saying. I know exactly how I am. I've been down this road before. I drank over again and again over resentments and fear and depression. He said, you got to face this, and he walked me through it. And I, it was a, a letter I had to write followed by a phone call at a certain time that I told him I would call in the, in the letter. I had to give him the address of the halfway house I'm living in, which I thought was a really dumb idea. And I, I remember waiting those 10 days, and I picked up that phone. I called. I was shaking, and this woman answered the phone. She says, he's expecting your call. Put me right through. And he said to me, he said, I talked to my supervisor and we talked to the courts and you don't have to come back here and two, do the two years, but here's what you got to do. And he gave me a whole list of stuff and it was all stuff I could do. And consequently, uh, that remained a misdemeanor. It never went back to a felony. I didn't have to do the two years. And I'm a free man today. And years later, I got to get, I got to get a gaming license to run gaming establishments because I took care of, because I faced that. Um, it was the first time in my life I ever got in the wheelbarrow. Why did I get in the wheelbarrow? Because I'm virtuous or because I think it's a good idea? No, I got in the wheelbarrow because I'm telling you, there's nowhere else to go. My whole <laughs> life came down to God is either everything or he's nothing. Either these people in AA are right or I might as well just go find that bridge again and try to get up enough courage to kill myself because I am at the end of my rope. Now, I don't know how many times you've got to be at that place where God, where your life is, comes down to God's either everything or nothing through self-imposed crises where you're forced into the wheelbarrow until all of a sudden one day the crap's coming at you and you just get in the wheelbarrow. You just get in. As Scott says, volunteer. You just volunteer, you get in. I went six, five, six years ago, I went through a divorce that... There was a lot of money at stake. There was a lot of things that should have had me insane. And I'll tell you something. I, I stuck with my sponsor through all that. I, I was I did it's not that I didn't have emotionally really hard spots through that, but my actions were the actions of someone who was in the wheelbarrow. I can look back at that time in my life and feel and feel grateful that Alcoholics Anonymous <laughs> And that I had done this long enough. Now I've done, by that time, it had been almost a quarter of a century of practice in this crap before I started. I found myself one day getting in the wheelbarrow in a frightening situation, and I didn't have to be kicked in there or driven in there. I just got in the wheelbarrow. Yeah. Now that took a while. Now some people, the book says sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly. I'm a slow case, right? I know guy. I sponsor guys that, a year or two, they're just hopping in that wheelbarrow just like, to, like they have sense or something, you know? But that's not my story. Um, 
One other thing, and I'm going to turn it back to Scott. In this third paragraph, it, it refers to something that was confusing to me. It says, uh, it says, we never apologize to anyone for depending upon our creator. We laugh at those who think spirituality the we way of weakness. Paradoxically, it is the way of strength. The verdict of the ages is that faith means courage. All men of faith have courage. They trust their God. I was speaking in a meeting on, I think it was step two years ago. This is quite a while ago. And a woman came up to me after the meeting and she said something to me that really set me back. And it had me spinning in my head. And it, up, it kind of put me off balance. And what she said to me, she came up to me, she said, well, you know, everything you said is fine for you. You have a lot of self-confidence. And I, I, I didn't know what to say to her. I, and I walked away. I walked away from that talking to myself, right? And I'm talking, here's what I'm saying to myself. I'm thinking, why would she say, I don't have self-confidence. Jeez, after what I know about me, I don't trust me at all. What is she talking Why would she say that? Self-confidence. No, I don't have self-confidence. And I'm like thinking, what is she, why did she think that? Why what do I look like? I mean. Uh, I'm like, self-confidence? No, I don't trust me. What am I? And then I realized what she saw. What appeared to be my demeanor was someone who had self-confidence, but it wasn't confidence in self. It was trust in God. And I think at that point, maybe more than even trusting in God is I trusted you. And I trusted Alcoholics Anonymous. I think I trusted AA I, in the pit of my stomach, really and truly, I think I trusted my sponsor and the people in my group and the things I heard coming to me from something in meetings first before I could be alone with that thing inside of me and start to trust that. I, I, I still sometimes have a struggle with trusting my, the, God, the God instinct inside me, the intuition. Uh, it wasn't too many years ago that I was in a situation... Uh, with my, that God was telling me through the pit of my stomach that I had an employee that I had to get rid of. And my head went crap. My head said, well, you can't do that. You have no evidence she's doing anything wrong. She's been with you all these years. This would be dumb. How could you ruin her life? You can't just let someone go, for God's sakes. What would, here's the big one. What would people say? Ego. Feel the ego in there? So I didn't. By the time I finally let her go, I think she'd stolen over a quarter million dollars from me. God was trying to tell me, but I, the problem is I'm still very inexperienced in this. I've spent more of my life listening to this than I have to this, to the God within me. And, and I'm sober a long time, and I still think if we, were to, if we were to chart how much of Bob's life he's trusted God and how much of Bob's life he's listened to his own head, I think, unfortunately, my head's still ahead of the curve a little bit, you know, truthfully. Um, so I, uh, I trust. That's why I have a sponsor. I trust him. There's, I think there's a covenant in Alcoholics Anonymous brought to us by God that when two or more of us meet for the purpose of recovery, something shows up in the midst. Now, my sponsor, did, I, don't, I wouldn't want my sponsor to manage his own life. He, I think he would be bad. But he does a good job at mine. And it's funny. I do very well. I, I do very well with the guys I sponsor. I can give them direction that they couldn't give themselves. But and they can give me they could give me direction for my life that's better than what I would come up with. Uh, the ego the ego you have to the problem is being sponsorable. You can't let God work through people when you are him. Scott? He touched something that's been just a, a real joy for me. Have you had the experience of somebody you sponsor or someone you're close to asks you a question, and the moment before they ask, you didn't know the answer, and you open your mouth and this beautiful piece of truth falls out that wasn't, wasn't of you but was through you, and three hours later you can't quote it and, and maybe can't even remember what it was? <laughs> need it <laughs> yeah 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 and you got to call him say what was it i hope you wrote that down um and it's just a, such a spectacular thing and i would say wow did you hear that uh, man i'm good i'm really good i'm not that good <laughs> one more quick story we'll take a break uh i moved out of the home my first wife and i were living in when i was sober six years 
she was tearing me up one more time. She, she told our daughter a couple of years ago that when I got sober, I changed, and she didn't. I did a lot of things to make her very, very sick. I'm guilty as charged. This is not her inventory, all right? I pray for her. God bless her. I put her through hell. But she's ripping me one more time, and I can't stand it. And I got this moment of clarity that said, she's 5'5", five, five, 105, you're 6 feet, 210. You're about to give her a straight right to the face, and when she goes down, you're going with her. She's on the way to the hospital. You are on the way to the jail. It's a bad plan. Worked it out all by myself. And uh, I did about face in, in mid-screech and went out and got in the car and drove away. Bought a newspaper. Want ads. 48 hours later, I moved into an apartment, and I don't know what to do. I don't believe in divorce, and yet I know if I live with her, I'm going to hit her. Because um, she used to control me with my guilt. And I got here, I'm not guilty anymore. I'm uncontrollable. And that was hard for her. And I was given a gift. I'm going to share it just in case somebody can use it. It's a set of prayers that works so beautifully for me. Because I asked for help on that, and this is what I got. And I prayed these three prayers each morning. The first prayer is, God, if it's your will for us to be together, put us together. The second one, if it's your will for us to be apart, put us apart. Those are the easy ones. Here's the one that counts. God, if it's your will for me not to know today, leave me not knowing. Yeah. Step one, section B, in prayer form. Guidance will be here right on time. If it's his will for me not to know today, I'm asking not to know. And when I can do that and mean it, I can have my sponsor's definition of serenity. He said, serenity is not freedom from the storm. Serenity is peace in the midst of the storm. And I can only do that if I'm not demanding guidance before it gets here. If I'm willing to walk in his presence and not know. When I can do that, I can be at peace. We're going to take a short one this time, about 12 and a half minutes. Please be back on time. We will.